Welcome to The Crafty View. I'm Diane Williams and I'm the host for the show. And I have a wonderful guest for you to learn all about the work that she does. Her name is Ann Campbell. Ann, welcome to the show. Thank you, Diane. I'm glad to be here. Are you sitting in your studio now? What? Technically, yes, but technically it's my garage. I see some work behind you and I can't wait to ask you about yeah. that. But, but let's talk about you as an artist and a craftsperson. How long have you been doing the art form and what is your art form? Uh, found object sculpture is what I'm currently doing. I <clears throat> probably have been doing that for 20, 15 years now. Um, I was an art major at Ole Miss and I have been drawing my whole life. But uh, when I got to Ole Miss, I was like, okay, these people are 10 times better than me. I, I need to find another avenue or a venue. So uh, I focused on pottery while I was there, but more hand building than anything else. So I was more into sculpture than, um, than I was regular pottery, throwing or cups and mugs. That wasn't my thing. So hand building, found objects, sculpting those objects is pretty much uh, a part of uh, the elements you uh, incorporate or you use for your work. Yes, I take uh, various objects and I keep looking at them until they tell me what they are. I don't always know what something is right away. Um, for instance, I use croquet sets all the time to make my dogs. Oh, he's wonderful. So I had an overabundance of croquet balls. And then one day I just, it, it like a light bulb went off in my head and I went, ah, birds, sheep. So I make uh, owls out of the croquet balls. I also make sheep, which I don't have one handy. So I can't show you that, but I've also made rabbits. I've used the croquet balls for heads on my angels. So every everything has a purpose with me. Uh, I don't let anything go to waste. I have uh, totes all over the place full of junk that I don't know what it's going to be yet, but it, it'll come to me one day. I'd like to talk about some of the elements in the two objects that we've just seen. You've given us the basic element, but there are a lot of things going on in that dog and in that owl. Right. The dog. This is a croquet mallet, a roller skate from when we were kids, not what they have now. This is a children's shoe last for the head. Washers and um, the word escapes me, bottle caps. <laughs> this is a kitchen cabinet knob and I just make the springs for the tail. Now for the owl, I used, um, these are a gauge, they have numbers around them, so it's a gauge, and also washers and bottle caps. This is part of a steamer basket. I don't, you can't see it because I did it, I painted it a color. And then this is a curtain ring that I used to sit it on. This was a honey dipper, you know, the little sticks that you dip into your honey. So I cut that in half to make the feet. So just whatever works out is what I use. And I don't know how to explain it. It just comes to me. There's a place in North Carolina called a scrap exchange. I don't know if you've ever heard of that place, but a person like you would go crazy in that place finding wonderful things. Yeah, I found some great places up here. There's also another one called Reconsidered Goods in Greensboro that I want to go to, but I haven't yet because it's, you know, it's a two hour drive. But I will find all these places. I think Rhonda Blassingame had told me about the scrap place that you there's also one here called scrounger's paradise which i love and it's a local thing is there a I, that tobacco barn and various antique stores and salvage places up here tobacco barn is that where you could get those uh boxes cigar boxes and things like that no it's it's really just an antique mall that they was a tobacco barn in its previous life, and now it's an antique mall with all kinds of vendors and all. And speaking of 
various kind of vendors. I'm going into a new place here in Asheville called Marquee Asheville. And it is in an old warehouse. It's an old foundry building. And it, they, it will be artists and other vintage makers. So people who like take old chairs and reupholster them, uh, people like me, uh, then there'll also just be various art like painters and sculptors and potters. And so it's gonna be a really cool venue, I think. It's not opening until June, however. What would you tell someone that wanted to start working with scraps and putting things together as it relates to maybe, a, is there a formula to doing this? Is there such thing as too much? Oh, there's no such thing as too much. I think you, you know when it's just right. You know when, to, like anything, like a, one of your quilts or something, you know when to stop. There's that little voice inside your head that goes, okay, I think I've done enough. Or you might put that one thing on there and you went, nope, that's too much. I've got to take that off. So that's, it's just, there's no formula. Of course, when you're making an animal, like I do most of the time, then there is a formula because it, animals only have certain things on them. Uh, but I also like, I've something else I've started doing. I do, uh, I'm trying to do kind of home decor items. And this is made out of, this was the leg to my bed that got broken when I moved. So this is my table, uh, bed leg. Then I had this, this was a, I think this came off a curtain rod that I found in the garbage in my old neighborhood in Mississippi. This is, I'm not sure what this is. This was an egg cup. And then this is just a round piece of wood that I had. So I put them all together and make a really cool finial. And then here's a different one. This is an old trophy base that Ann Brunson gave me these. This is part of a spindle. And then again, my leg off my bed and then just another topper. But I kind of, I'm kind of in the home decor at the moment for some reason. So some of the items that you've made that I really like, I, I remember that you, the, I looked at the tail of that dog, the wire tail. You used to mm -hmm. do those dragonflies. Those oh, I still make those, yeah. The dragonflies. And then you would take the wire that is used, um, for like the Brillo type wire, mm -hmm. and uh, you make those doggies. I have that sitting on my kitchen counter. And another thing that I really enjoyed, and these are just small items, is I like a doorknob. Do you want now? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's sort of like the part of a door and then you gave it the dog ears and I have mm -hmm. that outside of my door and people love it uh, when they walk by my apartment to see that dog. And some of them <laughs> try to, they think they could touch his nose to ring the doorbell. <laughs> well, it does look like a door knocker. I will give you that if you put, especially if you put it on the door. I call those house pets from house parts. Oh, I love the name. Do you name everything? Yes, everything has a name. For instance, the dog on the roller skates, those are all rolling rovers. Uh, the others don't have so much a name, but then I give them, a. they have a title. Like for a dog, for instance, I might do check out my face bone page or the owl might, I'll, I'll see you later. Or a sheep might be, I love you, E-W-E. -E. So I just kind of, um, I'd like to play with puns and just kind of be, how to give it a double meaning. What is your, what is your customer's favorite items? Hmm. Well, there are several people who collect me and anytime I try to come up with something new, they'll, they'll come, they'll buy the new I, my best seller are my Rolling Rovers, my dogs. I've sold probably about 300 of those. Uh, I hate to admit that I've made something over and over again, but when you find something that works, you kind of stick with it. Of course, a potter makes mugs over and over again, so why wouldn't I make a dog? Mm -hmm. There's some things behind you, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking around <laughs> to see what that is. Talk about what you have behind you. I have um, a robot. This is made out of a foundry pattern that I got from um, Old House Depot in Jackson. These are, and I'm not sure quite what they are. 
but they're from this area. You know, there are a lot of textile manufacturers in North Carolina at, at one time. There aren't so many now. And this is something to do with textile manufacturing, like a spool or something. I cut it in half though to use it for the legs. And then these are blocks. And then these are just a block of wood and these tiny little wrenches. You know, when you order a piece of furniture online and they send you wrenches, please save those for me because I use them. These are my antennas on my robot. And I also made a smaller version. So it's a mom and pop. Then I also have these. I made these for my booth at, um, at the Marquee Asheville. So I can put my things on a higher elevation instead of just having them flat on the table. I can have them like that. So they'll be sitting up and you'll have, you can make a, a cuter display that way when it's, you know, different lights. And then more finials. And then this is something I started this year because there was a, an artist here who inspired me. Uh, and so, I'm making similar birdhouses to his. I'm not copying him, but they're very similar. They're in my, uh, and I, oh gosh, your I'm at a lot of word. Your it's my style, thank you. Mm -hmm. He's just style. similar, but I use, I use found objects and he uses just wood. So this is like, um, you know, on a croquet set where you, at the end, you have to hit your ball to hit the stake. That's what this is. Uh, this is old beadboard, a ruler. This is a foundry pattern piece as well. And then just old scrap wood that I found here. I have two friends who are, uh, one is a carpenter and he brings me all his spare wood and the other one also makes chairs. So he gives me his spare wood too. So I'm, I'm kind of glad that I'm not having to buy wood now <laughs> because I get it gifted to me. Well, you know, you look like such a lady. And I say that because as I look at the work that you do and the sturdiness, it looks so solid and so sturdy. It doesn't look like it'll fall apart. So what that's telling me is that even though you're a lady, you use tools. Let's talk about the tools. I do, okay. I have, let's see if I can move this without tearing up. I have a chop saw, a band saw. I also have a uh, nail gun. That's my most recent purchase. I love it. And over here is my workbench. And that workbench was my father's. He made that. So of course I had to move it up here. The uh, little stool here in the corner. I don't know if you can see it. My great, my grandfather made that. So I come from a long line of, um, builders and people who make do. Um, I even made, which I don't know if you can see it really well, but this, I made this piece of furniture. This is a potting bench that I made uh, recently. I have junk on it, of course. But that's also going to go in my booth at the at Marquee Asheville. And I made another table using a uh, black pipe to use as my display pieces. It's not in here. It's at my neighbor is being very nice and let me store things in her garage. Because as you can see, my garage is very full and I don't have room to store things anymore. Wonderful. It's a two car garage, but two cars never fit in it. So you're in Asheville, North Carolina? Yes. And you at one time were living in, in the Jackson, Metro Jackson community. And you have a studio there as well. Right, I, I purchased a building in downtown Jackson in 2006 as part of my re retirement plan. And uh, I wanted to make it available to artists at a reasonable price. For instance, here in Asheville, 150 square foot space, studio space is $400. In Jackson at my studio, it de depending on how much you want, it ranges 150 at the highest to $50. Uh, and I have currently, 
I think seven artists there. Rhonda Blassingame, of course. Brian Newman, he's a new member of the Guild. Ellen Langford, Allison, Oliver Kelly, and Virginia Watkins, who's also a member of the Guild. And then um, Allison's son, Scott, is also there. I don't know what Scott does because some of these people moved in after I moved to Nashville, Asheville and I haven't met them. So you have every, you have supported other artists and the art forms, you mentioned their names, but everything from a fiber artist to a painter. As a matter of fact, you've been in my studio. <laughs> That's right, I'm a fiber artist. And it was fabulous. It was fabulous space. I think I had a 10 by 10, which was very comfortable. Mm -hmm. it, surprisingly, it's plenty of room depending on what you do. Uh, I think Ellen Langford probably has the biggest space there, but she's it's it's narrow and, and long, but it, it gives her plenty of room to do her paintings. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brian has a kiln there and um, a potter's wheel, and he's pretty much there every day. So I, I did want to do what I could to help local artists. And, and you know, if you couldn't afford to pay me that month, that's fine too. But then I also uh, also have three apartments in the building, which that's my my income uh, keeps me keeps me able to do my art. That's and I also have an artist there, Sabrina Howard. I had to stop stop and think. I know so many Sabrinas. I had to stop and think of her last name, Sabrina Howard, which is a nationally known artist as well as Ellen. Ellen is a nationally known artist. So I, I try to promote the arts. That as is best I can. And artists need that kind of support, you know, that kind of boost so that they can do what they do at affordable prices and, and it makes it better for their customers as well. So oh. you mentioned um, uh, your booth. So that means you do shows. And I know you had a busy month of March. Talk about some of the places and shows, exhibitions that you've done. Well, that, that's the thing. I haven't done that many because I don't like doing it. I now like <laughs> the idea of being in one place and not moving around. For instance, my rent at Marquee Asheville will be $250 and 15%. Whereas, you know, the average show is uh, anywhere from $250 to $500 to do for a three-day weekend. And then you have to come and go, you know, you move your stuff every day. That's the, I love the part of the selling, the being there at the actual show and the selling. I hate the moving in and the moving out and the, and you have to do it twice. You have to pack up here, then you get there and then you pack, unpack, you set up for three days and then you unpack and go home and then you unpack again. So it's, it's a lot of work for, it can be decent money, but I never found that uh, an, a show per se was my venue. However, I always did well at Chimneyville. And Chimneyville is the Craftsman's Guild annual show during the month of December. I thought, I, you know, I tried a couple of shows in New Orleans. I did, um, The, I think it was the Blues Festival. I did uh, one at the Old Mint and in the French Quarter. And, uh, you know, New Orleans wasn't my venue either, which very su surprised me very much. However, I was a, in a gallery in New Orleans and did very well. I could have made a living off of the gallery that was on Royal Street in New Orleans. Unfortunately, they have since closed. Um, but so galleries and... A permanent venue is more my, I think it's more people, some art is an impulse buy, but some people who, there are a lot of people who don't get what I do. You know, why would I want that in my house or why would I pay you that much for it? And I think that's a problem with all artists. People want to go, well, that, the age old question is how long did it take you to make that? And the answer is, you know, 20 years, because that's how long I've been studying and doing my, 
it, that's how long it took me to perfect it. And um, I like to, for instance, a person will see my dog and they'll go, well, I can make that. And I said, sure you can. But you know, you, you can't buy you, just one croquet mallet usually. You have to buy the whole set. So you've bought that. Then you have to find the shoe. You know, you can, you can duplicate what I do very easily, but it still won't have the heart and the soul that I put into it. It may look similar, but there are little things that I do that you don't notice that make it have more personality. That's right. You do have a signature style. And one of the things I could say about you that I know is that you have, and you don't, you're so humble, you never talk about it, but you've won, uh, well, I don't, let's not say you won, but you were adjudicated and you received a fellowship for artistic excellence, which is defined as originality, a keen sense of technique and process, and technical mastery of the art form. And that was deemed by the Mississippi Arts Commission. And then you're a fellow member in the Craftsman's Guild. And that means you've achieved a level of, I, I don't care what you say, 20 years, 15, 20, 25 years as a master artist. I agree because it, you're really, you really perfect your craft. The more you work at it, the better you get at it. Like um, even five years ago, I wouldn't have attempted, like I never would have attempted to make this, this uh, potter's bench um, 15 years ago. It never would have dawned on me to make furniture. But once I have that for two reasons, of course, it's too big to move in, in and out of a show. But so now that I have this permanent location, or will have this permanent location, I'll be able to make bigger and better things. So I, it's kind of expanded my horizons. Um, I'll, I'm also doing more wall pieces now, more things that you hang on the wall, which I did not do before because I was trying, you know, I was only thinking when I first started, I was like, ooh, animals, what animals can I do? And then I just got stuck in this, let's make more animals, let's make more animals. And I got stuck in that realm and I finally came and one of the pictures that you have is of my blocks that I made into America which is titled Blockhead America and and it is a wall piece so it's and if you look at it closely you won't notice it just glancing at it but there are words in there like I did put USA in there and I put myself in there um, so it's it's very I'm just trying to do more different things and, and trying to think of, uh, for instance, let's see the piano key thing. That's a key holder. Wait, I'm gonna pull it up. Okay. Okay. So that's just a play on words as well. You know, keys, piano keys. It's just like another pun. Uh, the uh, number three there, that is, I call that uh, a man cave. It's a Petroliana piece, pretty much, which that three is a gas station number, you know, like for a price, the old gas station signs that had, they had to change the numbers to do that. And then the, it's a, a wall sconce, but it's also an, a mirror from a 19, I don't know what car now, I'm, I'm sure some car geek could tell us that but that is a side view mirror from an old six, 1960s car the uh dressmaker's bust is this is also something i did for um my booth because i i do make a, an occasional piece of jewelry so i did that to put it in my booth but i also wanted it to have my style. I looked at for one that was, you know, an old dressmaker's uh, form, but I couldn't find one that I, you know, they're six, $700. So I didn't want to pay that for it. I found that bust, the, the, not, it's not a bust, that form. And then I made the base for it. And then I thought it needs something else. And I just happened to have those wings that I had bought I don't know how many years ago and I added those to it. And I think it really added a little something special and gave it my touch to add the wings as well. Yes. 
And then the next piece, the bird there, in which I've, I regret that I did not take a better picture of that. But that one is an old bowling pin that I cut the top off and I carved the head to, I had a woman who, um, she she's, collects my work in Vicksburg and she built a house and put in a spiral staircase. And she wanted a bird or something to sit at the top of the post of her spiral staircase. So this is a hawk that I made for her to put at the top of her spiral staircase. And it's all made from a bowling pin and old leather. But and it then looks, those, it looks so lifelike. Yeah, I was real, I was very happy with how it turned out. That's why I took a picture, a close up of the head. And then of course, living in Asheville, I have had bears in my yard. So I was inspired to make a bear from the, and it's, it, I'm sitting in my garage right now and there is a huge male bear that lit den somewhere around my house. So that's kind of what inspired me. Uh, it's very uh, cool. I, I never thought I would see bears in life, in real life, except in a zoo. And it's so weird to look out your front door and there's one walking across your front yard. So I love bears now. And I've probably seen about, seen about eight now. Haven't seen them this year, but I'm sure I will. What are the elements of this bear? The uh, base is, uh, I think that was, I think that was a wooden platter, you know, like a, that you'd put on your table to put on chips and dip maybe. The nose, it was a foundry pattern, which uh, foundries, there was one in Jackson called Harper's Foundry and they made wood patterns that they would put into molasses and sand and they would imprint the, um, the mold into the sand and then pour the molten liquid in it and it would make that particular piece out of, out of steel or iron, iron, I guess is what they used. And then of course, those are uh, washers for the eyes. And I think on that one I used, um, just cut out some little ears. But it's amazing how tiny bear's ears are compared to their huge head. And then my angel, which I, I really kind of do a full, those just hit me at the moment and are inspired by what pieces I have. That one particular one there, those are children's shoe lasts, um, a foundry pattern, a that's one of the croquet balls. And then I'm not sure what the wings were. I think they may have been part of a weather vane. And they say February and I'm not sure what they say because I can't see it that big, but it, it, it says uh, February, maybe July, I think July. is that one. Mm -hmm. And then her, her uh, halo was a, a giant washer that I had found like a, four inch washer. And I also just pick up stuff on the side of the road in parking lots. If I look down and I see something I can use, I will pick it up. But I want to go back to something you said earlier about, you know, me being a woman and making things. Now, Jack will go with me to shows and people, because it's all assembled and I'll automatically assume that he made it. And I go, he couldn't screw a light bulb into a socket. <laughs> don't, please don't tell him I said that. <laughs> and, I, and so I go, no, I made all of this. And my father and I, who was also a member of the Guild, uh, worked together a lot when they first moved up to Jackson. He had a workshop and he's the one who taught me how to use all the tools. I, I'm a very, I, anything that goes wrong in the house, I'm the one who fixes it, fixes the toilet, the plumbing, whatever. Uh, so I'm the handy woman and I'm thinking about putting on my tags for the uh, Marquis Asheville woman made instead of handmade because I want people to know that a woman made it. And I think that's why I put that emphasis on there because it's mm -hmm. such an assumption. It is. I get it all the time. It doesn't make me angry, but I, I kind of roll my eyes at it when people ask me, did you make this? And I go, yes, I did. I do it every day. 
Great. Have you taught classes? Have you mentored anyone? I have taught classes. I've taught classes at the Craftsman's Guild, of course. Um, I did have a gallery at one time called Artichoke on Fortification Street. And we did have, we did offer classes in the summer to kids. So we did that. Um, I think I did, um, what's that one that Mac does? I did it in Meridian. I can't remember what, uh, something stay. The whole school summer institute. Right, I've, I've done that once as well. I had a place in Arkansas ask me to come do it, um, but they didn't want, and I, and I hate to say it like this, but they didn't want to pay me. And I had to point out to them, you, you do realize that I'm eight hours away. I have to drive there and I need to, it's going to take longer than one day for me to even get there. Plus they wanted me to do a two day class. And I think they wanted to pay me $150 for this two day class. And I've said, I'm sorry, I just can't do it for that because they were making money from it. It wasn't like they were gonna let people do it. For, if they were gonna give it to the people, if it were a free class, I'd be more than happy to teach it. But it, it's, you have to compensate artists. Uh, their time is not, it's not, it's not easy to do this for a living without another income. So when you, when you do, when you are able to share, which I do love to share, uh, I think you should be rightfully compensated. That's right. Otherwise you'd be in a poor house. And what does it mean to you? And what do you think it might mean to someone else to be a member of the Craftsman's Guild? How, how has that been meaningful for you? Well, it's, it's really cool to be able to say that you're a member of the Guild because people do high, hold it in high esteem and they go, oh, well, her work must be good if they if they're a member of the guild, and and rightfully so, not necessarily mine, but anyone who's a member of the guild, because I don't think people realize the process that we have to go through to become members, and that it is, and it's and it's very difficult to put yourself out there. I hear a lot of people say they won't apply because it's. It's like telling, you know, me telling you your children are ugly. Uh, these are my kids and this is, I put my heart and soul in everything that I do. And so it's a tough thing to put yourself out there uh, to be judged. But once you are, it gives you a sense of accomplishment, um, a sense of pride and a very proud uh, to be from Mississippi and to say that, we have this because I've been to so many places. Uh, I went to a convention one time back in the uh, late eighties and somebody was making fun of the fact that I was from Jackson, Mississippi. And I said, you do know that we have an opera company about two ballet companies. We also have the international ballet competition, um, you know, and I would point out what all Jackson has and what all Mississippi has. And people just automatically assume because we're Mississippi that we don't have it. That's right. And I think our opera company is the 10th oldest in the nation, if I'm not and, mistaken. And our guild is what, going to be 40 years old in two years, something like that, or older now. I don't, I'm not, I'm not 73. So 50 years, no, I don't know how it is, but the guild, our guild is an old, one of the older guilds as well, oh, which is okay. be proud. Of. Mm -hmm. What is the largest piece you've ever made? Well, he's not still together, but I made a Frankenstein monster for the Halloween bash at the Craftsman's Guild where they had it. We all had all the sculptures out in the driveway where people could drive around and look at them. So I made an eight foot tall Frankenstein. I still have the head somewhere. I don't know where it is, but he was just made for that particular occasion. Well, I, I love the work that you do. Uh, I love the fact that, it, and I'm not, I'm not going to do a qualifier. I'm going to do a disqual. It's not so much. It's not whimsical, but it's it has such a, a strong presence uh, from the smallest piece to the largest piece. 
And, and it's just such a joy to uh, look at each of your pieces. If someone wanted to get in touch with you, how would they go about doing that? I do have an Instagram account, which is basically how most of my things are sold. And it's at Bottle Tree Studios, all one word. Or can get in touch with me through the Guild, I would imagine. There's a Facebook page for Bottle Tree Studios, which does have my phone number on there. But I will qualify this by saying I don't answer my phone unless I know the phone number. That was one of the reasons I kept my Mississippi phone number because now I know who's scamming me because all of the scam phones are from 601 area code. So if you do call me, leave me a message and I will call you back. Wonderful. And what else would you like for the viewers to know about you, your work or anything like that? One of the things you uh, mentioned is it brings me great joy. It's hard. I'm, I'm not an unhappy person. I'm a very happy person. And my work truly brings me joy. When I'm finished with something, I can't wait to share it with other people. It makes me smile. I, you know, if I'm down, all I have to do is come work in my studio and make something and I just, I'm on top of the world. So it really makes me happy to do what I'm doing. And I am so excited about my future venue at Marquee Asheville. I'm going to give them another shout out. Um, so if you're ever in the Asheville area and you can't get in touch with me, please go by the River Arts District, which is a really cool place in Asheville. It's this industrial area down by the river. And it's probably got I'd say at least a hundred artist studios that are all open and you can go and walk in every studio down there. So it's really, and then there's graffiti, not graffiti. That's the wrong word. There are murals everywhere in the arts district. And if you ever get to Asheville, it's not just the Biltmore. There's lots of artists here. That's one of the reasons I wanted to move here. Plus I love the mountains. I, I have enjoyed the summers here. 80s at the high and not humid. And so whenever locals say, damn, it's hot. And I just go, you don't know what hot is. <laughs> so we're, I'm very, I, and I don't mind winter. So it's not a, it's a good a trade-off for me, I think. You know, I would have to agree with you. Your work, I own a number of your pieces and they do make me happy. They really do. I don't care if they're five years old, seven years old, or brand new. The feeling I have when I look at a piece that I own of yours, and I always put it in that place so that I can enjoy it, it gives me a lot of joy. It does make me happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we can look at those pieces behind you and know that I'm not just saying that. It's very true. So I want to thank you, Ann Campbell, for being on the Crafty View today. And I want to thank all of our listeners for joining in. Thank you. Mm -hmm.